Hello everyone, thank you for joining today. We're just gonna give it a couple more minutes for a few more folks to join and then we'll start. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Utility Working Group webinar. Um, today, we're going to cover a few topics, including the overall trends in the EV industry, a, uh, some specific funding opportunities, including one from um, Bonneville Environmental Foundation, and some examples of EV projects with fall into some of these funding categories and similar opportunities. My name is Connor Herman. I'm a program manager at Forth, and we'll be monitoring the webinar today. To cover a few initial details, all attendees will be muted during the webinar. To ask questions, please use the attendee chat feature in the top left corner of your screen. I'll be reviewing questions as they come in, and we'll pass them to the appropriate speakers following their prepared presentations. We will also send the slides and video of the webinar to attendees following the presentation. To give a quick recap of the work, work of Forth, we are a nonprofit trade association and advocate for electric, shared, and smart mobility. Based in Portland, Oregon, we have over 170 member companies and organizations, including global automakers, utilities, and local governments from across the US. We're active in four primary areas, including industry growth and development, policy advocacy, demonstration and pilot projects, and direct consumer engagement. I also wanted to provide a reminder that Forth is co-hosting the 33rd International Vehicle Symposium, EVS 33. Uh, EVS is one of the uh, world's largest electric vehicle um, conferences. And amongst the COVID-19 updates, I just wanted to share that we are still scheduled to continue with the conference on plan, but we will update if anything changes. In addition to several great features at the conference, Forth will be hosting two workshops tailored to utility staff during the week of the conference. Uh, so be on the lookout for more information in the coming weeks. So now I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, Patricia Taylor serves as the American Public Power Association Senior Manager of Regulatory Policy and Business Programs. She supports the Moving Public Power Forward Strategic Initiative, which revolves around preparing members for this new era in the electric sector. Her focus areas include distributed energy resources and utility business models. When Patricia first joined the association in 2015, she served as the engineering services specialist, working on safety, mutual aid, security, and public power line workers rodeo. Uh, so now I'll let Patricia take it away with the first presentation. This is Patricia Taylor, Senior Manager of Regulatory Policy and Business Programs from the American Public Power Association. 
I want to thank Forrest for inviting me here today to speak to all of you about electric vehicle programs. Uh, I catered this a little bit towards public power, but I think the themes are going to carry over to all utility business models. And in this difficult time, I just want to wish you all good health. For those of you who are unfamiliar with my organization, uh, we go by APPA for short. We're the National Trade Organization for Public Power Electric Utilities. So we represent roughly 2,000 public power utilities that serve 49 million people in 49 states. And what we do is advocate and advise on electricity policy, technology, trends, training, and operations. Oh, I'm sorry, it looks like this slide got a little uh, disoriented, but moving public power forward is one of our strategic initiatives. We have a variety of initiatives at our organization that help shape our priorities and activities. And the idea here is that the industry is changing pretty rapidly, both from a technology standpoint and a customer standpoint. Uh, electric vehicles and DERs fit under this moving public power forward umbrella for us. And we're helping our members through for example, research. We have an R&D program called DEED that gives out grants and scholarships. We educate through our webinars, conferences, resources, and reports. We advocate on the Hill and to key industry stakeholders, and we also develop new tools and technologies. So to baseline, why should utilities care about electric vehicles to begin with? And the bottom line here is that EVs really are a big opportunity for the electric sector, and they are also a challenge. So in terms of opportunities, they are a load and revenue growth opportunity, electric vehicles charged with electricity, of course. Uh, there are also benefits associated with the lower operating and maintenance costs when you compare the cost of electricity to fuel a vehicle versus the cost you'd be paying to fill up at the gas tank. Electricity tends to be cheaper. And EVs have fewer moving pieces, so they tend to be cheaper and easier to maintain as well. There are also environmental and public health benefits associated with the lack of tailpipe emissions. So that's a benefit to your communities at large. And really the challenge comes into play when you're thinking of this whole new load coming on your system and if it's not being managed and if you're not monitoring it because that could add to your peak demand, which would not be ideal, and it could stress certain grid assets. So I want to go through some EV market trends and obstacles before we talk about EV program design. So EV prices are coming down, and that's great for customers, that's great for the market, and we can largely thank the falling cost of batteries for that trend. EV sales have been increasing on a global level. We have been seeing sales in the U.S. increase, generally speaking, over time. However, I will just note that 2019 sales were not quite as high as folks had hoped. 2018 sales were higher, uh, and now I'm not sure what all the COVID impacts are going to be with uh, EVs and other DERs, but before this, a lot of different organizations were projecting steady growth for EV sales, both U.S. and globally. EV range is improving, so that means if your battery is fully charging your vehicle, how far you can drive, that number is getting better and better. We're seeing more EV models entering the market, so that's because we have more audio manufacturers uh, producing models for customers, and we're seeing just a variety of the vehicle types that are being offered as well. I'd like to remind folks that EVs go beyond firstly owned vehicles. So there's also, you may have heard of electric buses for public transit, electric school buses, electric UPS delivery trucks or Amazon delivery trucks. So there are a lot of different fleet vehicles and other types of vehicles that are interested in going electric. Charging infrastructure is a big thing here. The rate of deployment is increasing. The interest there is ongoing. We don't have a robust public charging infrastructure network. So you're seeing a lot of momentum to try and build that out. And for stakeholders are getting involved, you're seeing utilities, you're seeing third parties, on manufacturers, even oil and gas companies. So what's holding us back? There are some key obstacles in the market right now that it's good to be aware of. One is related to cost. I mentioned costs are coming down, and that's true, but from an upfront cost basis, electric vehicles are not at cost parity with internal combustion engine or ICE vehicles right now. Knowledge and awareness is another big one. This is a new technology. How you operate is different. How you maintain it is different. How the cost of everything is a different structure for customers. So that's all new. And on top of that, there are a number of organizations out there who do surveys of the general population. And a lot of them have shown that the general public is not super educated on EVs, super aware of EVs, may not even be able to name an EV model. So if folks don't know about the technology, 
or understand it, that's certainly a barrier to actually buying into it. Charging infrastructure is another challenge area. In terms of availability, as I mentioned, we don't have a robust public charging infrastructure network right now. Reliability, unfortunately, not all deployments are successful. You wanna make sure you're maintaining the charging stations that are out there so that they can be working properly. Then interoperability is another challenge. Just to name a few examples of that, you may have noticed that depending who manufactures the vehicle, they may have a different plug type, or depending whose network you're going to when you pull up to charge, it could be that you need a fob or a credit card or a special login. So there's certain challenges to the, in the interoperability nature of the market. Range anxiety comes up time and time again as a top barrier for adoption, and that relates to the challenges with charging infrastructure. People want to be able to get from point A to point B and not have to worry. And if they think that the infrastructure isn't there to support them or that their vehicle, because of the battery capacity, cannot go that far, that's a challenge. And I like to know that access to EVs can be another barrier. Just because a certain auto manufacturer is producing X number of vehicles doesn't mean that they're being stocked or in the showroom at your local auto dealer. So access can be a challenge. So the good news is for EVs who are interested in boosting the market, getting involved with the EV market, there are a lot of options for building out a program with your very own. So I'm gonna go through each of these ideas at more of a high level. So the first area is related to charging infrastructure. Mention that a big area of interest and a big barrier right now. So in terms of how utilities can get involved here, there's a range of options. It could be that as a utility, you know you want investment coming into your service territory, but maybe you don't want to be the one to own and operate it. In those cases, we're seeing some utilities offer incentives for the charging infrastructure. On the other side of the spectrum, we are seeing, for example, some of our members actually deploy, own, and operate the charging stations. But there's also an in-between option. There's something called make-ready investment. So, in these types of situations, you may have someone else pay for and actually install the charger, but the utility is basically getting everything ready up until that point. So uh, fixing the, the wiring, um, upgrading the service panels, those types of electrical upgrades. So basically it's easy to add in that charger and go. And so the picture I have here, just to show there are public power examples for each category that I'm talking about. This picture here is from Elk River Municipal Utilities in Minnesota. They benefited from a deed grant from us and deployed a level two and a fast charging station within their community. This is a picture of the level two. You can see they purchased a charge point charger. And part of the reason why I took a picture was I thought it was interesting. They had a whole branding for their EV program, which is called EVER, ER for Elk River. So you can see they have their branding here and also raising awareness of their utility at the charging station. Another area is fleet. So two sides to this coin. As a utility, you have your own fleet of vehicles. So if you're asking your customers to go electric, this can be an opportunity to lead by example and get firsthand experience with the technology. But there are also other fleet operators in the community. Could be public transit, could be school districts, could be ride sharing, could be private companies. But a utility has the option to be an educator, an advisor in these types of capacities. You can help explain charging needs what operations could look like for an electric vehicle, and cost is a big one, explaining rate design and what they should expect in terms of their bill. So these are big areas where a utility has the opportunity to help out. So again, I have an example. This is from Kirkwood Electric in Missouri. They have electrified at least a few of their vehicles in their fleet, and again, you can see it's fully branded. We have a powered by Kirkwood Electric on the door. I thought it was pretty neat. Another area is rate design and payment options. So rate design. This can be a tricky topic, but it's important to understand what rate offerings you have now and how they may be incentivizing or de-incentivizing electric vehicles. And rate design is a load management tool, so this can really help you manage that new load coming onto your system. We found that for a lot of electric vehicle specific rates, time of use rates are pretty popular. And what that basically does is provide a price signal to incentivize customers to charge off-peak. That could be at night when you have underlying underutilized capacity. It could be during the day in some places if you're curtailing solar, for example. It's going to depend on local conditions. And then for payment options, if you're the one putting out those chargers within your community, you want to consider the pros and cons to whether it's going to be free or pay per usage or pay per time or if it's a subscription model. And there could be certain regulations or state laws that you want to be following in those situations, but there are those four different models for public charging stations. 
So here is from a clip from the webpage from Salt River Project out in Arizona. They do have an EV specific rate. So this is the snapshot here. You can click here if you want to learn more. But at the top, you can see that they're pushing EV drivers to consider this EV price plan because when you compare the expected daily cost of charging an EV, using that price plan is more affordable than the time of day rate, EV3 or basic rate. And if you look at this chart on the bottom, what that's really telling you is that there are time of use differentiators. They vary based on season, they vary based on time of day, and they vary based on weekday versus weekend. Another area is vehicle grid integration technologies, and this can really help with that load management challenge I mentioned. You may have heard the term smart charging, managed charging, V1G, those are all the same thing. And the idea here is if you think of a traditional demand response program and say an air conditioner on a hot summer day, if you're reaching a peak event, maybe you're gonna turn off that AC unit or turn it down. It's the same idea with a vehicle, that in a peak event, you're gonna manage that charging of that vehicle. Now with vehicle two grid, C to G, this is kind of that next step. This is where the electricity and the battery is actually going back into the grid. And so the picture here is from Austin Energy in Texas. They've had this huge Austin Shines program going on that's mostly related to solar and storage, but they also have a V2G pilot with Pecan Street as a component of that. Another area, which I briefly mentioned earlier, but is incentives. We talked about cost being a barrier. So I've seen a number of utilities offering incentives for the vehicles or the charging stations or both. And I've seen these types of programs evolve over time as well. The example here is from Burlington Electric Department in Vermont. What's interesting, it may be hard to read, but they have a rebate for new vehicle and lease vehicle. And if you're low to moderate income, there's an adder, you can get even more money. And they have rebates available for used or pre-owned vehicles as well. So you can get creative here in looking at the scope of your program. Another area is, of course, monitoring, evaluating the adoption of your community and understanding what those impacts could look like for you and your operations. For tracking adoption, there could be opportunities to work with your local auto dealers to get sales information. You may be working with your state Department of Motor Vehicles to get registration data. You might be purchasing that data. You could be working with local coalitions who are tracking adoption. And of course, don't forget, if you have an incentive program or a rate schedule, the people that are opting into that are telling you they have an electric vehicle. So that also can help you track what's going on. Monitor what's happening at your state and local level. There's a lot of interest in EVs at the national level, a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. But when I think of things getting across the finish line, I think there's more action happening at that state local level. So keep an eye on that. And utilities are also studying driver and charging behavior and analyzing charging station utilization. And this has helped you understand more about what the load shapes are going to be like. So for example, Lincoln Electric System in Nebraska, they got a deed grant from us to work with Fleet Karma. And what they're doing is studying charging behavior. And what they're interested in is they're saying, you know, we're a Midwestern city. We're not like California or some other areas. We actually have all four seasons. So we want to get years worth of data and look at what are the load shapes going to be for us. Education is another huge area. I mentioned knowledge and awareness is a big gap for the EV market and utilities can really help out here. Utilities are grid experts, they're energy experts. So this is another energy technology that you can help educate on. And think of who you're educating broadly. It's not just your normal customers, it's also your own staff, the customer call representatives, it's those auto dealers that are selling the vehicles in your community. They may not be as educated or incentivized to sell electric vehicles so you can work with them. And in terms of what you're educating these different customer bases on, it can range from your own program to explaining the technology itself, what the benefits and motivators are, lots of options. And then in terms of how you educate, again, a variety of different mechanisms here. It could be you start off having some information on your website, and it could range to in-person events, local ride and drives. If there's a sustainability Earth Day festival, I've heard of our members going and making sure they have a booth. If you have an electric vehicle in your fleet, maybe you can bring that, answer questions, get folks interested. So here are just a couple snapshots from a couple of our member websites. We have Sacramento Municipal Utility Districts on the left and Seattle City Light on the right. May be a little bit hard to read, but I thought these were some great examples of how you can have a plethora of information 
for your customers readily available just on a website. So with Smud, for example, they partnered with Plugstar, so you can shop for EVs there. They have a whole FAQ question section where you can ask about what should I be asking before I buy an EV? How do I compare vehicles? How and where do I charge? Do you have discounts? Do you have classes? And with Seattle City Light, they have information on what your electric commute would cost. What is the generation portfolio of your utility? How clean is it? Where do I find charging stations? So a lot of good information right on the public website. And now to start wrapping this up, I think for an EV program to be successful, you're going to want to keep these attributes in mind. Keep an eye on your state and local condition. As I said, that's really important to know if there's additional goals or supportive policies or if there are disincentives in your state, you want to know about that. Develop a strategy and timeline. Determine your metrics. How are you going to see if this program is successful and do resource justification? Designate a champion, someone who's going to spearhead this and be accountable for the program. Work across your utility to refine and implement whatever you decide. Something that I love about EVs is I think it's a very multidisciplinary topic. So if you did everything I just talked about, you'd be working with your engineers, your rate folks, your senior leadership, all representatives across the board, engineers, energy services. Make sure to engage your community. Let them know what you're doing. Listen to their interests and their needs. And try your best to keep up with EV trends. It can be overwhelming, but if you're members of APPA, we have a lot of resources. Fourth, of course, is a resource for you, and I'm sure there are a lot of other state and local condition coalitions that you can leverage to keep up with trends and get information. I think I'm running up on time, so I won't go through this whole list, but I just have a list here of some of our APPA EV resources that you can check out. And I want to thank you all for your time today, and I believe we're holding questions till the end, so I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patricia. As you said, we're holding questions to the end, so please continue to use the attendee chat feature, and we'll go um, over those in a few minutes. Uh, so I just want to take the take a few minutes to discuss a uh, funding opportunity that is open right now specifically to Pacific Northwest um, public utilities, and that is by the Bonneville Environmental Foundation's Renewables Program. Um, as part of the renewable energy work, BAF is launching a zero emission vehicle innovation fund um, where they uh, are funding Bonneville Power Administration uh, full preference customers for awards up to $50,000. Um, they have four funding categories, and that's infrastructure, community engagement, smart charging, and then an other category, which can be a combination of any of the three or some other innovative uh, approach to uh, advancing or promoting electric vehicles within their service territory. Uh, B BF has several funding priorities, um, starting from the top, increases equitable access to zero emission vehicles, promotes innovation through helping utilities overcome awareness, engagement, and ZV adoption barriers, contains potential for replicability, promotes current or future smart charging, inclusion of matching funds that exceeds required amount, and proposal to return revenue or clean fuel credits to BEF. Uh, there are several um, eligibility criteria, uh, and as mentioned, applicants must be preference utility uh, customers, which BPA defines as cooperatives or public bodies, such as municip municipalities and public utility districts that have priority access to federally generated power. Projects must propose solutions that have the potential to increase EV adoption within BPA utility territories. Uh, projects that address the needs of underserved communities are preferred. And as mentioned, with the need for matching funds, grants will be awarded up to 75% of project costs. And finally, projects that would be implemented within 12 months of the award notification are preferred. And then just logistically, the LOI is open right now, and that is due uh, April 17th. And if you are in full Asian, that'll be due June 30th. Um, applications may not exceed $50,000 and for a total award of $200,000. And BF does have a website up for this, which you can view the link here for more information. And then they also have uh, a contact information, uh, zv at bef.org. 
Uh, and then you can ask any questions about that. And we will also include these links in our follow-up email. So then I also want to go ahead with our final section here. I'll introduce my colleague, Thor. Uh, Thor is a senior program manager at Forth and works with utilities on customer education and engagement with electric vehicles. He is an award-winning nationally recognized energy professional focused on electrified transportation, renewable energy, and storage. Thor created and led the nation's leading renewable energy program at Portland General Electric. So you can go ahead, Thor, and uh, finish this off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Patricia. Those were great uh, introductions. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about some utility projects for the local utilities here in the Northwest that might uh, to help spur your thinking and maybe uh, get you interested in submitting a letter of intent to Bonneville for this uh, innovation fund. So uh, at, here at Forth, we found that there's a lot of ways to engage with the community around electric vehicles. One of the better ways that we've noticed is uh, community ride and drives. Um, and we've had a lot of experience in organizing these kind of events uh, for utilities throughout the Northwest, uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, gone down even to, to Northern California uh, to organize these events. And it gives people an opportunity to test drive an electric car to really experience the, the, uh, the, uh, the feel of driving an electric vehicle, which is unlike any other. Um, and we find that this is a great way to open uh, the public's mind and eyes to uh, electrification. And if we, uh, if these ride and drives are structured correctly, you can invite local car dealerships to participate as well. And uh, in, in, in lieu of what's going on with COVID-19 and, and the lack of showroom traffic uh, in the summer or, or when this uh, events are, when, when the, uh, everything dies down and, and things return to normal, we think this would also be a great way to help support your local auto dealerships in getting uh, traffic into their showroom. So uh, we've had a lot of success with ride and drives as a community engagement tool. Um, moving ahead here. Um, hmm. One of you please advance to the next slide. Go. Infrastructure. Um, this is something uh, to follow up on what Patricia was talking about was that, um, you know, perceptions uh, that your customers have around electric vehicles is really dependent on the amount of chargers and uh, charging equipment that they find in their community. And um, again, similar to what Patricia was talking about, we see that uh, utilities that can support the installation and maintenance of these uh, charging facilities, whether it's level two fast charge, which char typically charges most cars in between four and six hours, or DC fast chargers, which uh, typically can charge an electric car in less than, less than 50 minutes, are a, a key. Um, and level two uh, chargers, which typically use a 240 volt circuit, are fairly economic um, and easy for either residential customers or uh, uh, commercial customers to install. Um, and we found um, in working with uh, some of the utilities in the, in the Pacific Northwest, we've seen some real creative approaches to siting these uh, level two chargers. Uh, Chelan PUD up in Washington um, has used uh, level two charging in conjunction with local businesses to make their uh, shopping district uh, a, a, a tourist destination. And that's also applicable to hotels and restaurants that want to uh, put up a level two charger and just uh, find another way to attract customers to spend some time at their establishment and, um, you know, draw uh, this group of folks to uh, visit their, their business. Next slide, please. Uh, could you go back? There we go. Infrastructure. Next one would be smart charging. Uh, smart charging, uh, similar to what um, Patricia was talking about, is a way to ensure that the, the growth of load from these electric vehicles uh, on the local grid in your area is manageable. So the last thing you want on a hot day in, 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 in the summer is for everyone to get home, have their air conditioner running full blast, and to plug in their electric car. There's clearly opportunities to manage that load so that they don't conflict and, and provide a peak, peak load uh, on your system. 
So uh, we found that uh, working with companies around smart charging, uh, there's a lot of companies out there. ChargePoint is one of them. There's Greenlots, others, many others that um, can assist you in this in this uh, in this way to make sure that uh, these loads from these new electric vehicles are managed. And um, one of the, 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 the cases we thought was very interesting was, was the city of Ashland, which is looking to provide local businesses in the, in the city of Ashland with a $500 uh, rebate for new electric chargers. And these chargers then would all be connected to the utility so that that load could be managed. Uh, Eugene Water and Electric Board uh, in Eugene, Oregon, uh, also offers uh, a, a rebate, not only for uh, charging stations, but for the purchase of a, a new or used electric vehicle. So there's a lot of ways to really uh, use the type of funding that um, Bonneville, Power, um, excuse me, Bonneville Environmental Foundation is looking to offer you. Um, so let's go to the next slide here. And these are the... Uh, some of the other ways that we found that using money for transportation electrification can help you connect with your customers. Um, Puget Sound Energy uh, up in Washington is looking to, uh, to find ways to promote transportation electrification among low, in low income communities, um, including um, uh, non-medical emergency uh, transportation, simply getting back and forth to the doctor, uh, as well as multifamily and low-income housing car share pilots. These are an, an extremely interesting <clears throat> way to promote the benefits of electrification by allowing residents of a low-income facility to uh, use a car on a car share platform, something like Turo. Uh, many of you have been familiar with those. Uh, it's not that dissimilar to some of the uh, transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, but it allows... Uh, residents of these projects to uh, benefit from the low cost of transportation electrification and electric vehicles. Pacific Power, in fact, was the primary funder for one of the projects that Forth pioneered around providing uh, car electric car shares on a shared platform at the Hacienda community in Northeast Portland. Um, and that, uh, as well as, uh, uh, as, as, as an electric bike share, those were some of the ways that we saw uh, utilities step up to support um, low-income adoption of electric vehicles. Um, and currently, uh, Forth is, in conjunction with Pacific Power, is engaged in a EV car share pilot in a rural portion of Oregon uh, along the Columbia River uh, with Hood River, uh, the city of Hood River, that will allow uh, low-income residents at a multifamily housing project, uh, city employees, and uh, visitors to the community to enjoy the benefits of electric vehicles by using this common uh, software platform to uh, reserve the use of that electric vehicle. Next slide, please. So communications is key. What you need to do is to connect with your customers and find the ways that you think will be the most appropriate to help them make the move into electrification. Um, think about who you need to partner with. Is it a community? Is it local? Is it, commu is it a, uh, community members or community-based organizations? Or is, it a, or is it more in a regional effort? Um, these, uh, to be clear, new infrastructure like the installation of uh, new charging systems can take time and planning. So start thinking about that now. Um, what you also want to do is leverage the creative opportunities, the creative partnerships. Think about how you can work with community-based organizations that might be willing to work with you. One of the easiest ways would be perhaps um, providing electric vehicles and some chargers for a local food bank, which obviously in this time of need and, and, and national emergency are going to, are going to be stressed. And providing uh, used or new electric vehicles and perhaps a charger or two to keep them fueled up is a wonderful way to benefit both the community and demonstrate the benefits of electrification. Um, and then, you know, building this equity component is important. Um, you know, where are you locating these projects and who are you looking to reach? Think about the, the, the underserved portions of your community and how any demonstration project that you want to um, put together will benefit them. 
Um, we, we need to see electrification as a benef public benefit for all income groups, not, uh, not just the high end or not just the low end. We want to make the benefits of electrification clear to all of your customers. And then, again, being creative, um, you might want to even think about um, combining some of the elements we talked about here. Um, so you might want to, uh, if you were going to offer a charger rebate to your customers, you might want to announce that at a community ride and drive. What better way to announce the benefits of electrification, and it, uh, in, including the rebate on, on electric vehicle chargers, than to host an event where you have a, a community ride and drive? Um, so those are some of our th that's some of our thinking about um, how you might want to spend this money. Again, the deadline is coming up rather quickly here on the 17th of uh, next month. So uh, anybody with any questions, feel free to reach out. We're happy to help, happy to help think through these pro this type of project, happy to help you find ways to get, get it put together and the application submitted. So at this point, I will turn it back over to, uh, to Connor and for any questions. Thank you, Thor. Yeah, we've had a few questions come in, so if you have any more, please send them our way. Uh, the first one is for Patricia. Um, what are APPA member utilities doing in the medium and heavy duty vehicle electrification space? Great, yeah, great question. I would say we have a few thousand rolling power electric utilities, so it definitely varies. But I know that there has been interest from our members, and some of them are in collaborative spaces. I know for example, with school buses, especially out in California, but also some of our other communities. Well, let me backtrack for a second. Public power is part of local government, so I think that puts us in a unique opportunity to really work with these other government entities, especially when you think of public uh, transit and school districts working together. So I know we've collaborated and I think helped on the infrastructure side, but also as an educator in those capacities. Like I know SMUD, for example, they helped with some of the early rollouts with school buses. I know in Vermont, Burlington Electric has their 100% renewable community going towards net zero. They've worked a lot in trying to get electric buses as part of public transit. In terms of more heavy duty, though, I know, for example, uh, there is a California effort to study, I want to say it's Route 5, and what the charging infrastructure needs are going to be for heavy duty duty trucks to move along that corridor. So I believe SMUD, LEDWP, Seattle City Light, and some of our other members are participating in that. So I would say we're, we're seeing more interest in that area. Those are a few examples that at least come to mind. Great, thank you. Uh, another question for you, Patricia. Um, what mm -hmm. special rate programs or infrastructure incentive programs is APPA recommending for members to encourage EV use and infrastructure build out uh, for both passenger and commercial vehicle applications? So in our position as a national trade group, we really like those types of decisions to be made at more of a local level um, since they are going to be dependent from community to community. So. I work in the area of, of rates and EVs, of course. What we do is more educate on the pros and cons and case studies of what others are doing in the rate space. So, for example, with time of use rates for EVs, that's become, I think, pretty popular for a reason because of the load management capabilities there. So we educate our members on the potential benefits with that. But it's really up to them to decide if and when they want to implement these rate programs. Demand charges can be a contentious area in the rate space, especially when you think of fast charging stations and potentially heavy medium duty vehicles down the road, with that we kind of take a similar position where we educate on the pros and cons. I know some investor owned utilities and some public car utilities also have done these demand charge holidays, if you will, or scaling those back. And the reason for that is for those who may be familiar with fast charging stations right now, and if you're subject to a demand charge and you're not getting a lot of utilization, that demand charge can be a large portion of your bill, which can be a deterrent for people looking to make a business case out of building out this infrastructure. So we're seeing utilities take some creative approaches to deal with these issues, but as with many things, there are pros and cons to everything. So 
there's also a movement with just in VRs in general that maybe we should have more real time and more demand charges for residential. So it's, it's a mixed bag there. So I wouldn't say we're telling our members to do one rate design versus the other, but we're trying to educate them on industry trends and the reasons why folks are moving in certain directions. Um, and I would say the same goes for incentives and in infrastructure investment. As I mentioned, we're seeing a number of our members get interested in providing incentives for infrastructure, and that could be that they're providing rebates for workplaces or rebates for commercial settings or level two or fast charging. So it, it's going to vary and it's going to depend on the utility number. Thanks. Um, I have another question come in that I will try to um, transcribe. Uh, so uh, this individual first commented that uh, they believe that there are two groups of individuals. Uh, those that have not owned an EV have range anxiety, um, sees a public charger and then buys an EV, but then ultimately charges at home. And then the second group is uh, not an EV owner, does not own a home and are not in a prioritized um, area for affordable public charging. Um, and I guess the question for that is, is do you treat these groups differently when trying to promote EVs? And I think more importantly, what can you do for that second group that does not have a home? Um, and how do you um, make EVs more acceptable or available uh, for them? Um, and, uh, Patricia or Thor, uh, would any of you like to take that? Sure, I have some thoughts, but I'll let Patricia go first if she's got any ideas. Sure. Well, I think this person raises an interesting topic. I mean, and things can evolve over time as we build up more infrastructure. But right now, I think the stats are 90 to 95% of, of charging happens at home. But of course, that's not an option for, for everybody. Even for me, even though I'm a homeowner, I have a town home with no ground and no dedicated parking spot. So, so what am I going to do? And then here, I guess there's an added layer of if you're not in an area prioritized for public charging. Um, some immediate things that come to my mind are workplace charging can be another good opportunity for folks. And in terms of, I think Thor mentioned this, and I like this concept, how can you think of transportation electrification as something that can touch everyone within a community? So when you think of public transit or trying to get electric ride sharing to these communities, there could be other areas um, to focus on. But Thor, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. I think um, what we're seeing here in the in the Pacific Northwest is are, are two important trends that affect. I think the that the the uh, questioner's second group of customers. The, I mean, second group of utility customers, the ones that may live in multifamily and don't have access to charging, and aren't familiar with electric cars. First of all, I think um, that's part of the community engagement piece here is that you want to provide opportunities for the community to live as, to learn as much about uh, electric vehicles as they can. Uh, hosting those ride and drives uh, is it really important. And then I think what we want to do is, is to talk to and think through some of the issues that, uh, some of the problems that uh, low, perhaps the low income segment of your community uh, deal with. Like, uh, for example, with uh, Puget Sound Energy, they realize that there's a lot of people that have to get back and forth for doctor's appointments, maybe need to go to the pharmacy, and that providing a small fleet of electric cars that they can access uh, is a wonderful way to educate people and show them how low cost these vehicles can be in terms of operating um, and maintenance. And it also gives them a better feel for what's really happening as we move into a future of electric transportation. And then thirdly, uh, the third point I wanted to mention is what we're seeing in Oregon is uh, kind of a, a market growth in the used electric vehicle segment. And one of the things that Forth is engaged in uh, with the city, with, excuse me, with the state of Oregon is promoting electric vehicle rebate on used electric vehicles. So there are more and more vehicles coming off of lease that are electric that are, are, you know, that you can look to for the this particular segment of your customers that now can access elect, uh, the benefits of electrification. Uh, again, it's going to take some thinking and some infrastructure uh, build out to get there, but it's um, it's time to start thinking about that now.
thanks uh, to both of you. And I'll also add uh, another example from Puget Sound Energy because they have a, a, a great plan out is that they are um, working on building out some fast charging stations and they're uh, prioritizing um, locating them near multi-unit dwellings. So folks that don't have a home and often there is a, a big barrier to installing um, charging at these these uh, units in general. So we're planning to install these units and then see if this has any effect on the adoption rates in that area. So I think that's just a cool example of a pilot that is going on right now to kind of start to look at these these issues for folks that um, don't own our home and um, also might be in more low income areas. Um, so that is it for the main uh, questions, and I actually had one more question I would uh, throw out to either uh, Patricia or Thor. Um, for our utility folks that have not started to get too active in the transportation electrification phase, what do you think is the, the low-hanging fruit or kind of the first step or first couple of steps utilities should, should take to kind of start getting in this space and start preparing uh, for you know, bigger projects in the future? Patricia, you want to take a run at that one first? Sure. I think if you're kind of starting at ground zero, I I think education would probably be the, the first thing. Educate yourself on the technology, what the options are, looking at the adoption within your community. Kind of just set a baseline to figure out where you're at and decide where you want to be. Um, so I think kind of educating and getting a landscape would be the first step um, in terms of building out a program. And, and this is Thor, and I, I, I completely agree with what Patricia just said. And I also am a big fan of uh, ride and drives, or uh, I've seen other utilities uh, purchase an electric car for their own use and then allow their, this, these would be public utilities, and would allow uh, members of the public then to use the car overnight or for a day or two just to get everybody familiar with, the, with what it takes to operate an electric car. Because when people get behind the wheel, of an electric car, it's inevitable. They get out of the car for the first time and say, wow, I never knew. It's, it's, it changes their whole perspective. Yeah, I'll just say, I, I agree with what Thor said, and I've heard the same thing from our members about the benefit of those community ride and drives and getting out there. And that's an opportunity to interface with your customers, you know, face to face and really answer their questions. And I think that takes away the, the feeling that this is a foreign technology, it makes it more real, more tangible, and, and firsthand experience is really, it's hard to beat. <laughs> totally agree. Thank you both. Um, so I think that's wrapping it up for today. I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar and to be on the lookout for a follow-up email, which will have a video and some slides and links in there as well. Uh, please reach out to Forth or any of the speakers if you have any questions about what we discussed or are interested in you know, help on any uh, projects. We look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you.